Good afternoon. Um, we welcome you to the CME program organized by the Sri Lanka College of Microbiologists in collaboration with the Expert Committee on Communicable Diseases of the Sri Lanka Medical Association, uh, which is a timely topic. It is on antimicrobials towards shale. So uh, may I cordially invite Dr. Ranjit Pereira, the chairperson of the uh, Expert Committee on Communicable Diseases, of SLMA to chair the session. All right. Okay. Uh, breaking news. Uh, uh, Dr. Anchit Pereira will be uh, uh, coming to the head table uh, at the end of the uh, CME uh, lecture the talks, basically at the Q&A session. So may I kindly invite our first speaker for the day, uh, Dr. Malika Karunaratna, who is the president of Sri Lanka College of Microbiologists to talk on um, antimicrobial stewardship. This is an introduction to antimicrobial stewardship in hospitals. Over to you, madam. Thank you, Chaturi. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, now, Today, now, this SLMA session is on antimicrobial stewardship. First one. Yes, um, antimicrobial stewardship programs in hospitals. Uh, I think by now you may know that uh, we have started, we in the sense, the Ministry of Health uh, with uh, collaboration with other colleges, uh, mainly the Sri Lanka College of Microbiologists, have started the implementation of antimicrobial stewardship programs in hospitals. Actually, early also these programs were there, the, the certain components of antimicrobial stewardship programs were there, but this time we have started it in a very systematic way. So we will see what is this antimicrobial stewardship programs are and this, uh, how to implement it in your uh, the hospitals and also mainly the, this program is actually we have planned to um, the, the do for the prescribers. So what is the role of the prescribers? So in my lecture, I will just introduce you to this antimicrobial stewardship programs. So uh, first of all, uh, now you may have heard about this. You have heard, you know about this infection prevention and control programs in our hospitals. So and also you know that these programs are there to prevent the spread of antimicrobial resistance organisms and also mainly to prevent the hospital-acquired infections. Uh, this hospital-acquired infections mainly uh, by the AMR, uh, that means antimicrobial resistant organisms. So in uh, and, uh, the IPC programs also we talk about AMR. And then antimicrobial stewardship programs are there to prevent the emergence of antimicrobial resistance. So in all those programs, we talk about antimicrobial resistance, the infection IPC programs to prevent the spread of these organisms here and there among the patients and uh, among the you know, healthcare staff. Uh, the stewardship programs, uh, it's um, uh, one step ahead. It's to prevent the emergence of these resistant organisms. So, you know, now by now you may have realized the importance of this antimicrobial stewardship programs. So, both talk about AMR. Um, so, both programs are equally important. Um, so, what is this antimicrobial resistance? If, we, if I just show you this, um, you may have come across all of you this sort of uh, reports. So this is the blood culture report, Klebsiella pneumoniae. So it is resistant to all the antibiotics which have been checked. So this is antimicrobial resistance we are talking about, right? So whenever we want to uh, treat patients, suppose now our patient has this sort of infection, how are we going to treat? What are we going to do? So this is the antimicrobial resistance we are talking about. And 
this is the antimicrobial resistance we are going to prevent by implementing antimicrobial stewardship programs. So this is another thing that uh, you have realized this. Uh, you have, uh, I think most of you have prescribed the, this sort of uh, antibiotics like this. Now see, what is the, uh, just see whether you all can spot the error here. Now uh, this, um, this uh, uh, prescription chart has uh, flucloxacillin, linozolid, ticoplanin, and levofloxine, right? So flucloxine, generally, we um, uh, use to treat staphylococcus aureus infections, which are resistant to, uh, we, sorry, which are sensitive to cloxacillin. So linozolid, ticoplanin, we think of these antibiotics when we want to address the MRSA infections, right? So in one, in one, uh, prescription chart to have all these antibiotics together is the misuse or overuse, right? This is the reason for antimicrobial resistance. This is what we want to prevent because the misuse and overuse of antimicrobials are the main drivers of antimicrobial resistance, right? So, if I just give you a definition, resistance means, antimicrobial resistance means an organism that is not inhibited or killed by an antimicrobial agent at concentrations of the drug achievable in the body after normal dosage. So this is what we call uh, the resistant bacteria, right? So this is the, re now uh, we know that there are two types of resistance. One is uh, the uh, the intrinsic uh, intrinsic resistance. Certain organisms are intrinsically resistant to antibiotics. We call them as bugs born to be bad. So uh, uh, the, now, if I just give you an example, Streptococcus pneumoniae. This is intrinsically resistant to ciprofloxacin. So if you prescribe uh, ciprofloxacin for your patient who is having a community acquired pneumonia. That is wrong. That is misuse or that is um, uh, the overuse or misuse of antibiotics, right? Another example is all gram negatives are resistant to uh, vancomycin and ticoplanin. They don't have gram negative cover. So hereafter, uh, when you get an antibiotic sensitivity report, if you are treating your patient with vancomycin and you have found that this patient is having a gram negative infection, don't ask, don't tell us that we haven't checked uh, this isolate for uh, vancomycin and ticoplanin. The very reason is uh, they are intrinsically resistant, right? But so these things, we can't do anything. This is intrinsically resistant. So we don't have any role in role here. But uh, the major issue is some, um, the, the acquired resistance. Now, organisms, they are not uh, intrinsically resistant but they acquire resistance, right? So that is the major issue. That is what we are going to prevent by implementing successful antimicrobial stewardship programs. So if you, now you may be familiar with this one. Now here, now generally, if I just let you know, generally uh, the this uh, bacteria are not like us. They multiply very rapidly, rapid multiplication. That, that is their nature. Right? During their multiplication, one or two resistant organisms, um, the mutations can happen. But they won't last long because there is a competition for space, a competition for nutrition and everything. So therefore, this one or two um, resistant mutants can't have a big impact. But um, now if we use antibiotics haphazardly, the sensitive organisms will die and these resistant organisms will multiply and cause various problems in our patients, in our bodies, in healthcare workers, right? So that is what we want to prevent by implementing antimicrobial stewardship programs. So here now we know they, they don't stop at that level. This resistance genes can spread to the other organisms also, other sensitive bacteria also, and it can cause uh, several disasters, right? The, the, there are several mechanisms that they can spread to the other organisms like transduction, conjugation, transformation. I'm not going to go into the details of those. So this is what we want to prevent by implementing stewardship programs. 
So how to treat these infections? Now, um, why we need the antimicrobial stewardship programs, right? The, the resistance is there, but we can think that there may be a lot of antibiotics to treat these resistant organisms, but that is not the way. The speed at which the organisms become resistant to antibiotics is much higher than the speed the new antibiotics are developed. So there is a gap. The antibiotic pipeline is drying up, right? Because this the antibiotic because of this resistant antibiotic uh, industry has become a very um, the poorly attractive industry. It is not very lucrative. So antibiotics are and also antibiotics are not lifelong medications. So therefore, um, no one is uh, uh, the not, uh, only very few people are interested in. Uh, developing this, it's a very costly uh, thing, developing a drug. So at the same time, now I just want to highlight this AMR can kill faster than hypertension or diabetes, AMR infections. It can even um, the kill children without any comorbidities, without any issue. They, they can kill young, healthy adults, right? So it is very dangerous. Nowhere in the world, if you can't just hide, you can't just go to another hospital, another country and get the treatment if that antibiotics are not available and that uh, organism is resistant to all the available antibiotics. It's not like other uh, diseases. So therefore, um, it's a huge problem. It is uh, actually very scary. The situation is very scary. So as prescribers, you have a huge responsibility to prevent uh, antimicrobial resistance and to support the antimicrobial stewardship programs in your hospitals. So uh, now I am repeating this, antimicrobial stewardship is a growing threat. It has a health impact, economic impact, and environmental impact, right? So the prediction is by 2050, there will be 10 million deaths per year due to um, uh, antimicrobial resistance infections. So uh, infections due to antimicrobial resistant organisms, right? This is actually 10 times more than the, uh, the current death rate. The current death rate is around 1 million. So therefore, um, this is uh, actually, we need to take this as a um, huge problem. And uh, the, sadly, the most of these deaths, 90% of deaths are due, um, or will occur in uh, the resource poor areas where we uh, include, uh, we, where we belong. Now, like Asia and Africa. So we are also in the uh, area, this 90% of deaths, right? So main reason was identified as lack of successful antimicrobial stewardship programs and uh, lack of um, IPC programs. So therefore, both are very important. Not only the IPC programs, AMS programs are also equally important to prevent, to um, avoid these uh, deaths in our countries. So I just show you one data just for you to highlight our situation. In 2021 national surveillance data, I have taken this from the glass. Now, any one of you can go to this gla glass website and just see this global surveillance data website. Uh, our country in Sri Lanka, Klebsiella pneumonia in blood cultures, um, it is um, uh, the resistant to meropenem is 48%, whereas UK, it's 0%. So you can just understand the the scary situation that we are facing, we will be facing in future, right? So this is, uh, we have to consider this as a serious thing. Uh, and uh, now we are facing this cholestine resistance also. So therefore, uh, that is where, that is why we need antimicrobial stewardship program. So as a country, we have this national strategic plan, 2023 to 2028, and there are, we have identified uh, so many priority areas, antibiotic, uh, the uh, rationalizing antimicrobial prescription is one priority area, right? So antimicrobial stewardships are there to use antibiotics carefully, right? Careful and responsible management of antibiotics uh, will be done and will or will be addressed by the antimicrobial stewardship programs. So 
there are so many things, optimal selection, optimal dosing, duration of antimicrobial treatment, resulting in the best clinical outcomes, everything. This is not just uh, caring antibiotics or the, not just uh, treating antibiotics or not just not pre uh, preserving antibiotics. Preserving antibiotics while improving or while keeping the best clinical outcome. So, uh, in short, uh, the, the, the AMS is using right drug for the right bug uh, for, uh, in right dosage, right route and right duration. So, this is in order to improve the patient outcomes while minimizing antimicrobial resistant developments, right? So this is uh, antimicrobial stewardship. I just show you the components of antimicrobial stewardship. Here you will notice that uh, 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 prescribing antibiotics when they are truly needed, prescribing appropriate antibiotics with adequate dosage, using the shorter duration of antibiotics based on evidence, and uh, reassessing treatment when culture results are available. So these are the things we want from you, right? As prescribers, these, this is your responsibility in addition to other, other components like controlling source, source of infection, that is a surgeon's uh, responsibility, then supporting surveillance of AMR, educating staff and other things. This is the main thing that we uh, want you to think of. So to implement the stewardship programs, we have uh, we have identified four tools: um, the, the national guideline for antimicrobial stewardship, aware classification, prescription chart, and national guideline on empirical and prophylactic use of antimicrobials. So uh, if we implement uh, these tools in our hospitals, um, antimicrobial stewardship program will automatically uh, continue. It will automatically progress. Right, so this is very important. I will uh, quickly go through one by one. Uh, National guideline on antimicrobial stewardship and circular. This has been issued as a circular. There's a circular number, national requirement. Right, so uh, one point I want to highlight: a point and AMS team. This AMS team will be appointed by should be appointed by the hospital director. Right. So there is a, uh, the clause here, led by a consultant microbiologist or a consultant physician if a microbiologist is not available. So anybody who is interested in these stewardship programs can lead this stewardship team, right? That is what I, so everyone has a responsibility here. Now here, now I just uh, put this, uh, um, the composition uh, you can just trace uh, your, um, uh, your, the director should receive this by now. So you can just read. I'm not going to go into details. So aware classification. The second one is aware classification. There's a circular. I just put the circular number if you want to uh, trace it. Um, now, as a, as a enthusiast, enthusiastic person in antimicrobial stewardship, if in your hospital, if no one is interested in implementing this, you can just uh, um, tell the others that there is something like this. We have to um, follow these guidelines and circulars, right? Basically, the aware classification, we have uh, divided antibiotics into three groups, access, watch, and reserve. Access group, the, this is actually, this division is based on the spectrum of antibiotics as well as the, the potential to develop antimicrobial resistance, right? So this access group, um, the narrow spectrum, anyone can start. Watch group also, anyone can start. Now, all the antibiotics that you use for uh, to treat uh, septic patients, sepsis, is they are in the watch group. So there is no restriction as such to treat sepsis patient by implementing this aware classification, right? Watch group, um, merapenem is there, vancomycin, piperacillin, so everything is there. Only thing is, uh, this aware classification uh, is going to implement the, if you are going to uh, continue these antibiotics beyond three days, then uh, you have to get the, uh, the, the opinion of your consultant or consensus of your consultant, right? So this is there to prevent unnecessary continuation of broad spectrum antibiotics. So that is that. So don't... Uh, 
uh, just have this myth, the idea of having this uh, uh, the this uh, uh, VR classification prevent the uh, treatment of uh, sepsis patient and uh, it's delay the uh, the treatment of sepsis patient. There is no such thing. Uh, this um, meropenem, vancomycin, everything can be started on time if you are there to treat your patient. If you are there on site, you can start. Otherwise, you can't start. So then uh, continuation should have a consultant opinion. So that means it's good for your patient also because if you are a consultant listening to this lecture, you have you have, you should know your responsibility. Please, um, with due respect, I am telling this. Uh, this is there to protect the patients and protect the antibiotics. Uh, otherwise, these antibiotics will not be safe to treat. Uh, septic patients. So then uh, the the antimicrobial prescription chart, right? There is a guide which has been issued from the Ministry of Health. This is also you can trace. Uh, so this prescription chart, I will just show you a few things. Uh, this chart is there to streamline the antimicrobial prescriptions in your ward, right? So there is the name, patient's name, the demographic data. There is a place to put. Um, now, you may wonder why we need to have another chart because already we are prescribing our antimicrobials in the normal chart uh, because we want to see or we want to encourage starting antibiotics um, for proper indications. And we want to encourage uh, the taking cultures before starting antibiotics. We want to um, uh, emphasize that uh, allergies should be uh, checked or mentioned before starting antibiotics, right? Those things. Uh, and also, now actually this is not our creation. This is not uh, the uh, sort of Sri Lanka microbiologist creation. This is worldwide accepted chart, right? Most of the countries, I told you, you know, that uh, the developed countries have stewardship, successful stewardship programs. That is the reason that they don't, they will not have the uh, the deaths, that predicted deaths, the only very few, the 90% of deaths occur in uh, resource poor countries. So this is, the, the, this, uh, the, the chart, these charts, the separate animal charts will be used by, is using all those uh, uh, resource, uh, the uh, the rich countries, right? So the most important part here is this reviews. Now there is a day two review after day two, then day seven, day 10. So this is not uh, just to check you. This is for the benefit of the patient and uh, for you. This day after day two review, uh, you have to just review the patient and put an anti uh, signature, right? So the day two, you can just see whether your patient is really need. The, by that time, you know the most of the time you know the diagnosis. Whether this patient needs antibiotic or you can assess the escalation, escalation, everything. Day ten review is a must because most of the uh, the antibiotic uh, this um, courses uh, can we can stop at day ten unless there is a real indication like endocarditis or deep seated uh, infections uh, or that sort of real indication. So I know that most of the time, uh, the anti we are very keen on starting antibiotics, but we don't uh, um, pay much attention to stop antibiotics. So these things, this chart will help you to um, help your juniors, help you or seniors to just attend to the antibiotics properly, right? And then uh, how to obtain this chart. Now there is an issue in the morning also, uh, how to um, obtain this chart. Now, all the um, hospitals where microbiologists are placed uh, at the, now as the first phase, uh, we are providing these charts from the MSD stores. Uh, so uh, there is a star number. Your hospital can uh, just um, order through the SR number and get the charts from there. And if you need it for the next year, you can just uh, order it um, through the... Now, there is a person who is uh, dedicated for this. Uh, in Every hospital has this uh, person to get down the stationery to the hospital. So he knows about it. Only thing is you have to inform the ward, right? So this is there. Um, uh, 
and please make sure that uh, the next year also you are getting this by ordering through the SR number. So this is, I just told you, I'm not going to uh, describe this again. The certain things should be filled by the nurses, certain things should be filled by the doctors and no nurses both. Right, see, now you you know, you can just see here, no, now one example, now coamoxiclam, root IV, dose 1.2, frequency 8 hourly. So when you want to omit, you have to omit this, right? So likewise, this is very clear. You can, straight away, you can just know the duration. Uh, this one, I think, uh, Lakmal will do this, uh, the four moments. And then the national guideline on empirical and prophylactic use of antimicrobials 2024. This is a very new thing. Um, uh, we have only very limited printed copies. We are in the process of getting down printed copies. But this is uploaded onto our website. Anyone can uh, go to our website and get this done, get this uh, downloaded. This is um, SSEM website. If you just uh, type it, you can just get. Right? So these are the four components of uh, antimicrobial stewardship programs. So I invite you to actively participate in the antimicrobial stewardship programs in your hospitals. You may be a microbiologist, you may be a prescriber, you may be another uh, the pharmacist or a nurse or whatever, but please actively participate in these uh, antimicrobial stewardship programs. This is not for us, this is for the uh, for everybody and for future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Madam, for that introductory and very informative talk. Next, we'll move to our second speaker. Um, actually, this CME program is aimed at uh, the prescribers. Our target audience is prescribers. So it's a very timely topic, prescribers' role in antimicrobial stewardship, uh, which will be delivered by Dr. Lakmal Fonseca, who is a consultant physician at the University Medical Unit National Hospital Gaul and senior lecturer at the Department of Medicine, Faculty of Medicine, University of Ruhuna. Um, over to you, Dr. Fonseca. Right. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you for inviting me to uh, discuss about this very important topic. And thank you, Dr. Malika, for setting the stage uh, for this talk. I'm going to dis uh, discuss about why, uh, as, uh, as prescribers, why this venture of optimizing antibiotics is important, and some practical tips of uh, yeah. how we can uh, contribute to this noble activity. So who are prescribers? So we should identify we, at some point, we might be prescribers, but uh, uh, we, it can be a general practitioner, a mainstream clinician, or it can be a house officer, uh, maybe in the ward or um, in outpatient department. But also there are there is other access uh, in our country that people can buy antibiotics from as uh, over-the-counter drugs as well. Uh, so, uh, so we need to think about these aspects, and uh, and we must consider us all of us as prescribers and attend to this. So, what can we think as a prescriber? How can we be mindful about antimicrobial resistance and take some action on it? 
So first step is be mindful about antimicrobial resistance in your clinical practice. Because if you're not aware, if you're not mindful what is happening around and what AMR doing to your clinical practice, you might not take steps to counteract and fight AMR. So I have listed some uh, of the indicators that I find it useful. Uh, it, it might be best to look at the percentage of patients who are on meropenem and piperazidine tazobactam in your ward and look at the number of cases of hospital-acquired infections and number of patients who is on antibiotics and de developing antibiotic-associated uh, diarrhea and number of drug-resistant culture reports that you see and patients who are dying despite being on broad spectrum antibiotics. If you have an idea about these factors, you might be aware that AMR is there in your ward, is there in your clinical practice, and you will be mindful to take steps. The second thing as clinicians, what we can do is use the antibiotic chart. So this is an important thing that the College of Microbiology has uh, devised uh, in the recent few months. So we have a dedicated antibiotic chart as Dr. Malika said. So why do we need a dedicated antibiotic chart is antibiotics are a special group of medication. You should treat antibiotics with respect because that is one of the only medication that can have resistance. If you prescribe a metformin or if you prescribe enlopril, you don't expect the patient to become resistant for that medication. So treat antibiotics as a special group. Therefore, fill this antibiotic chart. So this antibiotic chart should be filled and you have attend to all the fields of the chart and nurses and doctors collaboratively can fill this chart as well. And specifically, the antibiotic review should be filled by a doctor. And uh, there are a lot of other things that are important, patient identification, allergy to antibiotics, indication for antibiotics should be clearly documented and send blood cultures and urine cultures, and that should be documented there. And also, importantly, the antibiotic review is important. So we all like to be smart people. So why don't we apply to that for the antibiotics? So start antibiotics smart. So we have an uh, important guideline that is uh, launched recently, the College uh, Antimicrobial Guidelines in 2024. So we can refer easily to this uh, uh, antibiotic guideline and be smart. What does it mean by being smart? So this, remember this term, start smart and focus. Being smart is you are starting empirical choices of antibiotics, which will cover most of the organisms that you come across in a given infection. So you're being smart, you're being safe. But after you control the infection, you are, uh, you are now focusing on the antibiotic choice. So you can optimize the antibiotic by uh, we're going for a narrow spectrum antibiotic guided by the clinical results and also the culture reports after 48 to 72 hours. This is why our antibiotic review is very important to us. So for to being smart, start on guideline directed antibiotic therapy for conventional infections. As an example, cellulitis, you treat with flucloxacillin, which is the gold standard of treatment. But also being smart, you have to think about the severity of infection. Because you might see, you might come across a patient who is critically ill, who is in septic shock, who is in an immunosuppressive state. So these patients will need a broader spectrum antibiotic uh, to make them safe and to save their lives first. So usually I have given a rough guidance, a respiratory uh, escalation. You can use piperazilin tazobactam, and uh, you can, for the urinary source, you can roughly use meropenem as there are a lot of ESBLs in our setting. What else can we do as prescribers? Early source control is very important. Source in, means the, the where the infection starts with. It can be uh, starting from the kidney as a pyelonephritis, starting from uh, lungs as a pneumonia. So you must control the source. How can we do that? So source control of infection is important because it reduces the severity of infection and reduces the duration of antibiotics and also reduces the hospital stay. So the patients can go home early. This is very important. Uh, so we have to proactively look for the source of infection. It is being more active than being active. So being proactive. So, uh, so if there are 
sources that I given below, obstructed infected system, uh, uh, a pus collection or an abscess, if there's anaerobic collection, an empyema. Uh, so in these certain situations, you must ask for your colleagues, surgeons, or the, whatever the specialties that you come across, urologists, et cetera, and you must control the infection by controlling the source. You drain the abscesses, you uh, decompress the infected system, you open up the anaerobic pockets, and you, can, you have a better control of the infection. And you are basically saving the life of the patient and sending the patient home early. If you don't do this, if, you, if, if the source control is done inadequately or is it delayed, you are doing ineffective escalation. You might be happy that you are escalating the drugs for meropenem or piriprazidine, tazobactam, and et cetera, but you are not doing an effective exercise because the antibiotics won't reach the site of infection. Because, then you, because the best way to do is you do the source control and then let the antibiotics work. So early source control, everyone, is very important. So um, it is important for the cost as well. So you can, the patient would have a shorter hospital stay. I'm giving you a, one example that we had recently, an uncontrolled diabetic who admitted with an unhealthy toe. And he had, uh, as given in the picture, you can see that there is a, a source uh, which is there, which was not visible initially. There is some pus collection, which is tracking down to the fifth toe. But unfortunately, initially, an amputation was done, wound toilet was done, but this was not attended. So then you could see from the blue line, we have escalated these antibodies for the meropenem. But we can't expect the meropenem to work properly unless we drain these collections. So mind you, look at these important points and do the source control early so that you are giving a better chance for the antibodies to save lives. What else can we do? Antibiotic review after 48 to 72 hours. This is a very important step because we don't have to unnecessarily give antibiotics for people and we don't have to give unnecessarily long durations of antibiotics as well because we are inducing antimicrobial resistance. You might not see that effect immediately, but you will see in that in another few years or 10 years or something like that and we'll be in deep trouble. So what is what can we do for the antibiotic review? So go through these important steps and you are doing the antibiotic review properly. So make or review the diagnosis, whether it is an infection or a non-infectious condition, whether it's a viral or bacterial, and then confirm the diagnosis and confirm the source of infection. So go through these three steps and make, and make the diagnosis. And then you trace, you initially send blood cultures and urine cultures being smart, before starting antibiotics, but then you have to trace the blood cultures and urine cultures and see what is the results of that because you can take actions for those results. And then we see whether the an appropriate antibiotic is given, appropriate dose, and the route is given. Then you go to the patient and assess the patient properly and do a daily overall assessment. Mind you, anything that you, you see the patients daily, and you assess the patients daily for the antibiotics, do a specific daily assessments when in your antibiotic review. And then you plan on changing or optimizing antibiotic, either escalation of antibiotics or de-escalation of antibiotics. So usually this 48 hour review should be performed by a medical officer, but if there are any concerns, you can always discuss with your senior or a consultant. So what are the components of the daily overall assessment? This is very simple and straightforward. And uh, even a, a doctor or a nurse or any other healthcare professional can be able to do it. So see, first step is seeing whether the patient is clinically improving or not, or improving or deteriorating. So just one question, are you feeling better than yesterday? Is the appetite better? And I, have you start eating and drinking? If you just ask these three questions, you can get and gauge whether the patient is improving or not clinically. And second step, you look at the vital signs, the hemodynamics. How, are, how is the blood pressure? How is the ventilator requirement? How are the iron tropes? Are they tailing off? Re oxygen requirement is reducing. So you can get an gauge of the hemodynamic and the vital signs. And then examine the patient properly. Look at the physical science. Look, listen to your lungs and listen to, uh, you know, look at the cellulitis where the skin is wrinkling. So you elicit these physical signs and see whether the patient is clinically improving or not. And then look at the source. 
where the source is adequate control. If there's an infected obstructive system in the biliary tract or urinary tract, has it been attended to? Has it been drained? Has the stone been removed? Has the abscess been drained? So you attend to this source and see whether it is dealt with. And also see whether all the plastic material is removed. If the patient is on an unnecessary catheter, if the patient is on a cannula or in, in a central line, can these be, is the function, is the, are we still using it? If not, you can remove this plastic material because these are a, a great nidus for bacteria to grow and cause further infection. And then whether the diagnosis is finalized or not, and then finalize your antibiotic plan. So optimum antibiotic, the dose and the duration, and you plan on the de-escalation of antibiotic. I'll explain what is de-escalation next. So we are all good in escalating antibiotics. We usually know when to escalate to meropenem and all the broad spectrum. We, we should usually do it well. But are we equally good at de-escalation of antibiotics? We have to ask that question from ourselves. So what is de-escalation? People have a myth of de-escalation is, is bad. You are just cutting down or chopping down on antibiotics. It's not the mean. The, the right meaning of de-escalation is switching to a narrow spectrum antibiotic, which is equally effective and potentially more safe for the patient and for the society. So we are looking at an overall picture here. We are putting an equally safe antibiotics here. And uh, for the uh, antibiotic you had previous, the broader spectrum, you narrow spectrum, but they are equally effective. So de-escalation should be looked at case by case. You have to really go to your patient, assess the patient bedside and plan on de-escalation. If you have a culture report that's brilliant, that is very easy, straightforward de-escalation, which can be done by anyone. And if the culture says, uh, the, it is sensitive to uh, comoxiclav, and you have given meropenem, you can easily de-escalate to the narrow-spectrum antibiotic with a lot of safety. And then uh, it, sometimes you have a, one diagnosis confirmed. Imagine a patient who is you treated with infection, now diagnosed with dengue, and now diagnosed with leptos leptospirosis, and you have been given broad-spectrum antibiotics. Now you can Either sometimes, if it is dengue, you can basically stop antibiotics. If it is leptospirosis, you can switch to amoxicillin, IV or oral or doxycycline, and you can switch, de escalate the antibiotics in such ways. And then, mind you, ladies and gentlemen, one of the most important things that we must do in our clinical practice is IV to oral switch. It saves a lot of life, saves a lot of. Uh, uh, very cost-effective mode of treat treating patients. And most of the infections, you would need maximum seven to 10 days of antibiotics. So have that in your mind and then try to oral switch. I will tell you how, how we can do it. And initially we had an understanding that always IV antibiotics are way superior than, so you must treat all the infections as much as possible from IV. But now we are getting more and more evidence in certain infections, oral antibiotics, follow on are much safer than continuing IV. Uh, there are studies on like even some cases of like straightforward, not uncomplicated endocarditis and prosthetic joint infections. There are evidence coming up. You start with IV and it is very safe to switch to orals. So how can we do this IV to oral switch? So go through these four steps and see whether you can do the oral switch. So have the patient is clinically improved, the temperature has settled, it can come to baseline, normal, and you have achieved stability of the clinical parameters and downtrending WBC and CRP. Mind you, I tell downtrending. You don't have to give IV until the CRP or WBC count normalizes. You have to just realize you have had a control, you are controlling the infection. And there should be no concerns of GI absorption. If the patient is on an NG tube or if the, uh, there are signs of malabsorption, then you can't do an oral switch. But if you're seeing that the patient is eating and drinking and tolerating the meal is fine, so you know that there is good absorption. And then, then in, in the fourth instance, you have to see whether there are any complicated infections. So in these infections, it's, we may not be able to switch to uh, oral antibiotics. If there's CNS infection, cystic fibrosis, staph aureus bacteremia, endocarditis, and empyemas. So in these situations, you might not be able to switch to uh, oral antibiotic. So summarizing all that, think about the four moments of antibiotic decision-making. 
these are the four things that you should see in your antibiotic prescription. Whether you have made the diagnosis, whether the culture and empirical therapy is correct, and uh, whether you have stopped and narrowed down antibiotics uh, or done an oral switch, and think about the duration of antibiotic. So practically what we can do in the ward is we can do a quick antibiotic round and find out uh, what I suggest is do these two things first. Identify patients who are having uh, on antibiotics more than seven days in your ward and just identify people who are on meropenem and pilbrizin and tazobactam. I know that we all are busy in our wards. There are a huge amount of patient numbers. You might be busy with your daily activities, but you focus on these two things in your antibiotic round and apply these four moments of antibiotic decision-making. So this is why antibiotic stewardship there, it, it has the platform to govern all these principles. So it regulates and optimizes the antibiotic use and have a surveillance, good grip on how the antibiotics are used, and limits unnecessary prescriptions, inappropriate antibiotic usage, or unnecessary duration. But you, some people have a misinterpretation that a antimicrobial stewardship hinders the efforts to good control infection, but it's not. We are giving appropriate antibiotics and saving lives, improving clinical outcomes. So as a prescriber, what are the roles that you have? We, we, sh we should have the uh, understand AMR and get it into our mind and have decide what our role would be individually to counteract AMR. So as an outpatient prescriber, what can we do? So do not prescribe antibiotics in viral illnesses. I mean, you have to have the confidence in differentiation viral from bacterial infections. It needs some practice. You cannot just, uh, it, it will not come up automatically. You, might, you must practice in your day-to-day -day life, in your day-to-day -day practice, how to differentiate bacteria and viral and gather those skills. So if you have that skills, if it is viral, you are confident that you don't have to give an antibiotic. And use access group of antibiotics, and you have to refer to that aware classification in this area, as Dr. Malika pointed out. And education of the patient is very important. Say it's viral and it will get better in five to seven days. And usually in outpatient basis, three to five days antibiotic duration is, is, is enough. And as an inpatient prescriber, go through these important facts when you do a ward round, when you see patients. Is the antibiotic chart available in your ward? Has it been uh, actioned? And is it been attached to the BHTs? And then whether the antibiotic chart is filled properly, antibiotic review is performed or not. And do a quick antibiotic round, as I mentioned before, and identify people who are on broad spectrum antibiotics and also people who are on long durations more than seven days and do the antibiotic review and get help from your consultant or the microbiologist. And if there are people who are on meropenem, a broader spectrum, more effective antibiotic that we have, so after three days, just alert your consultant on that. So in, in, uh, in hospitals where there is no uh, antibiotic uh, chart is available, we can, we can use the old fashioned way. We can use, uh, chart the antibiotics in the fever chart and we can just write the antibiotics in red and we can, we can still do the antibiotic review and plan on de-escalation as I mentioned before. And one of the important things that you can do when you see antibiotic prescription is decide on a stop date of antibiotic when you see the patient. So don't just say openly, okay, just we can, we'll continue antibiotics, but always think about we are going to stop antibiotic on this particular date. Okay, you give seven days, but also mention, okay, we are going to stop antibiotics on 27th of August, exactly, something like that. So it will refine your antibiotic decision-making. What can we do as a leader, if you are a consultant or a, you know, a, a matron or a sister in the ward, you, you are in a leading role, what can we do? We can educate the junior staff, empower them for clinical assessment and antibiotic review. And think about infection control. Sometimes as physicians and uh, doctors, we sometimes overlook uh, infection control. We are having patients with MRSA, ESBL and multidrug resistant infections, and we might not do in fact, good infection control. Mind you, these patients spread this. Uh, we ourselves spread, spread these infections from one person to the other, and that person will need the broader spectrum antibiotic, and that person might lose their lives as well. So think about infection control and uh, 
collaborate with the infection control nurses and the teams and uh, do this job right as well. And also support a non-judgmental environment. It's very important for antibiotic storage. You are, you are basically liaising with different groups, the microbiologists, uh, the uh, other finer specialties, the ENT, ENT uh, cardiothoracics, so all the specialties are involved here. So it's very important to have a non-judgmental environment. Have a discussion with the colleagues and think about the best antibiotic plan on the best interest of the patient. And support authorization of broad spectrum antibiotics. Refer to the AVR classification and how are these antibiotics authorized and support that. And what can we do as an administrator? So support the national program, support the awareness programs and educational activities, and uh, be brave and have a antibiotic stewardship committee in your hospital and be engaged in monitoring antibiotics. And so in that way, you don't, if you don't have the data, you cannot drive this forward. So have the backup data, get the pharmacist involved, get the other teams involved and monitor the data and reassess yourself, your antibiotic choice, prescription pattern also. You can uh, monitor yourself and then feedback, give a feedback to your colleagues and to yourself and become better every day. Antibiotic stewardship and the, the prescription role of antibiotics, you cannot just learn it overnight. It needs a lot of expertise, it needs a lot of practice, and it needs a lot of thought and clinical experience. So think about a separate aspect in your clinical duties day-to-day -day life. And also support collaborative working environment with the ward team, microbiologists, pharmacists, administrators, and also your junior staff, and congratulate them when they have done it right. So in summary, think about the four moments of decision-making. I will emphasize that again because it's very extremely important. Uh, so first, make the diagnosis right. And second, the cultures and the empirical choice, whether this is right or wrong. And third, whether you have stopped or narrowed down the antibiotics, whether you have switched to oral, remember the IV to oral switch, and then Decide on the duration of antibiotics. Don't openly say, just continue antibiotics. Just give a stop date, okay, seven days completion from the beginning of antibiotic, and then uh, finalize your antibiotic decision making. So think about this. AMR has no boundaries. It will affect anyone, everyone. You are not immune against AMR, even if you have have a good antibiotic practice because it spreads from one person to the other. AMR, MRSA, ESPL, everything can spread one person to the other. So it's like an infectious disease. So it's duty of everyone to attend to this. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Fonseca, for that very interesting and informative talk. So we'll have the questions at the end, and we'll move on to the uh, third speaker of the CME program. As we know, um, all of you in the audience, we prescribers, we are actually pertinent to different fraternities, fraternities in medicine. So next we have a surgeon. So let's see what the uh, surgeon's role in antimicrobial stewardship is. Our speaker is Professor Ishan Dizoisa, Professor in Surgery at the Department of Surgery, Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo. Over to you, Professor Ishan. Good afternoon, Malika. Good afternoon, uh, 
ladies and gentlemen and uh, at the start let me thank uh, dr malika karunaratna and the slcim for inviting me to give this talk uh, it's actually a lot easier after that uh, very uh, comprehensive talk by my physician colleague so i will be speaking on the role of surgeons in antibiotic stewardship now we all know this discovery right which of penicillin right which was hailed as one of the greatest discoveries in science and uh, by about in about 10 about, about 10 years later um, penicillin was widely in use as an antibiotic and uh, in surgery the prospects of using antibiotics for prevention was almost immediately recognized as a possibility then came the discovery of sulfonamide and uh, this gentleman in fact went on to win the nobel prize in 1939 but see what has happened 100 years later right and uh, this was from a newsweek magazine right where they are saying that antibiotics are no longer effective against killing microbes that is because of antibiotic resistance so why has resistance emerged one reason is the promiscuous use of antibiotics especially for prevention and also failure to deescalate combination therapy inappropriate antibiotic therapy and also patient expectations which is quite a problem in sri lanka because a lot of patients who in fact have viral infections that don't require antibiotics still expect an antibiotic from a doctor but of course they can be educated and then of course there is the issue of prolonged administration when the necessity necessity no longer exists the result is pain resistance of pathogens to all available antibiotics there are other potential consequences of antibiotics bronchial asthma allergies obesity type 2 diabetes gord pseudomembranous colitis and oncogenesis so that is why these antibiotic stewardship programs assume even greater importance when it comes to antibiotic stewardship in surgery the goals are to avoid unnecessary antibiotic use to reduce resistance pressure to reduce unnecessary costs and also to reduce antibiotic associated morbidity the objectives include appropriate preventive antibiotic use effective source control of the infection avoiding delays in initiation avoiding excessive duration of antibiotics and better use of non antibiotic infection management strategies moving on to appropriate antibiotic use to prevent surgical site infection way back in the 1960s it was found that surgical site infection can be positioned 